we focus our attention on the present moment because of the way the Buddha taught karma. He said that our actions influence the future, and they also influence the present moment. In fact, it's our present actions that have an influence on the present that are going to determine whether we're going to suffer from it or not. So we want to look into the present moment to see exactly what we're doing. And the way we approach the present, as is defined in the first stage of mindfulness practice, focusing, say, on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Notice the two activities there, keeping focused on the body, in this case the breath, and then putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. We're looking at the breath on its own, without any reference to the world outside. That has to do with the Buddha's analysis on how suffering is caused. He says it's because of the type of craving that leads to becoming that we suffer. And becoming is a sense of your identity and a world of experience. But he also warned that one of those ways that lead to becoming, or types of craving that lead to becoming, is craving for non-becoming. In other words, hoping to destroy what you've got here in terms of your identity and this world. That's going to lead to more becoming, too. That creates a, a practical problem. So what do you do? It sounds like you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Well, the Buddha found the way out of that dilemma. He saw that if you could see the processes that lead up to becoming, just simply as processes, in the process of origination, then you could develop some dispassion for them. And in developing dispassion, you wouldn't put them together into a sense of you in a world of experience. And that way you'd be free. So when the Buddha teaches mindfulness, he teaches it on three stages. In that first one, keeping track of the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. You're letting go first of the world outside. You're focusing on the breath. But you're not totally without reference to the terms of becoming. Because if you look at the way the Buddha describes how you talk to yourself while you're, say, focused on the breath, or focused on feelings around the breath, or the mind states you can develop around the breath, or the mental qualities that either get in the way of staying with the breath or help you, you still use the concept of I and me. So those terms of becoming are still there. I will breathe in long. I will breathe out short. I will train myself to breathe sensitive to rapture. I'll train myself to breathe sensitive to pleasure. I, 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 still there. You're taking responsibility for your actions. Similarly, with when you're an analyzing, say, the presence of hindrances or the presence of the factors for awakening, sensual desire as the hindrance is present in me. Mindfulness as a factor for awakening is present in me. Me, me, me. But you're using I and me in a skillful way. Because it's on this level that you're going to get the mind into right concentration. In fact, you can read that instructions for being, keeping track, say, of the breath, ardent, alert, mindful, putting aside greed and distress with the world, as instructions for how to get into right concentration. There's even a passage where the Buddha seems to equate that description with being in the first jhana, when the mindfulness is really established in that framework. Then he says you keep track of the body in and of itself, but don't think thoughts of the body. Don't think thoughts connected with feelings or mind. Just be present with the experience. And that can get you into the second jhana. 
But then the Buddha says there are two other stages of mindfulness practice. One is being aware of the phenomenon of origination and passing away with reference states to the body or feelings, mind, mind mental qualities. He calls that developing, establishing mindfulness. And here you're looking at cause and effect. When the Buddha uses that word origination, he's talking about things arising from causes in the body and the mind. And to see causes, you have to manipulate things. So as he describes the different levels of jhana that you can get into, he's talking about how you can get the mind into different feeling tones. And it's interesting to note that the jhanas are defined in terms of their feeling tone. Sometimes you see it translated, the first jhana is accompanied by pleasure and rapture. But the Pali doesn't say accompany, it just says the first jhana, pleasure and rapture, born of seclusion. Second jhana, pleasure and rapture, born of concentration. Third jhana, you sense pleasure of the body. Fourth jhana, purity of mindfulness and equanimity. You focused on the feeling tone, and you look to see how it's originated. Now, the feeling tones that are of the flesh, as they're called, those have to do with just ordinary pleasures, pains, neutral feelings. And then there are feelings not of the flesh. And these are things that you manufacture, you give rise to them. This is where you get mindfulness as a governing principle. As the Buddha said, when you have mindfulness governing things, if there's something that's skillful that you don't have yet, you consciously give rise to it. Once it's there, you consciously try to keep it from pa passing away. So you're not just watching things coming and going willy-nilly. You're getting involved. And here you're consciously giving rise to deeper stages of concentration as you begin to realize how you can manipulate causes and effects in the mind to get the mind to settle down even more firmly. This is where you use concentration to develop both insight and tranquility. Nowadays they talk about insight and tranquility as different meditation methods, but the Buddha never has a description of an insight method or a tranquility method. He talks about tranquility and insight as mental qualities that you develop in the course of doing right concentration. And the breath is the primary example. He talks about the breath as bodily fabrication. When you talk in terms of fabrication, you talk in terms of insight. You get sensitive to the breath, you energize the breath, and then you calm bodily fabrication. The calming, that's the tranquility side. So you're getting practice in stilling and in insight into the process of fabrication at the same time. This way you're beginning to see things in terms of the description of the causes of suffering to give an independent core rising. And you're stripping away a few more of those terms of becoming. Because to get out of becoming, you have to stop thinking in those terms and start thinking more in terms of simply things are rising, passing away through causes, and seeing the individual events, and seeing that. Whatever you can make out of them, it's all going to fall apart. So you can develop some dispassion toward them. So you're watching origination and passing away. There's no mention of I or me in there, no explicit mention. But you still got the implicit world of the concentration. You're now in the becoming of form or becoming of the formless level. And the I and the me is still implicit, because you still have to make decisions as to what to do and what not to do. It's only on the third level of mindfulness practice when concentration is really solid and your insight is really good that you can drop all reference to any kind of term regarding becoming, whether it's the the world of the world outside, or the world of the body as you experience it from within. 
and that sense of you being there, that's put aside as well. The description is mindfulness is established simply to the extent of recollection there is a body. You're independent, not clinging to anything in the world. Although the word you is not there, just there is a body. And there's independence and there's no clinging. This is on the threshold of awakening. There are some descriptions of mindfulness practice nowadays where they glom all three levels together to make it sound like you're doing all three at once. But the Buddha definitely distinguishes between the three, or among the three. There's an or. You do this, or you do that, or you do that. It's not all the same. And it's important that you realize there is a time and a place in the practice for having a sense of I or me doing the practice. So you can be responsible of what you're doing and sensitive to what you're doing. That's only when things get really, really mastered when the mind reaches a state of equilibrium that you're ready for that final practice of just being independent, not clinging to anything in the world. No reference to a self, no reference to a world. That's how you work your way through that dilemma. So as you're practicing here, try to strip away as many of the terms of becoming as you can. Because as long as you're thinking in terms of becoming, even in terms of wanting to destroy a becoming, you're stuck. The cravings that come there will just keep you on falling for more and more becoming. Then to be stuck in that position that the Buddha describes rebirth. You're a being because you're clinging. And you're going to be clinging to that craving, and that craving is going to take you on, just like wind takes a fire from one house to another. And we know how un uncontrollable that can be. But if you can let go of the terms, so that you're not thinking in terms of you as a being, or a world that you're in, or a world that you're going to, there's a chance that the fire can go out. So you get really good at looking at your experience in these terms. The Johns would often say, sit here as if there's no world out there, it's just you and the breath. And after all, it's not even you and the breath, it's just awareness and the breath. As you depersonalize these things, you actually get more and more intimate with what you're actually experiencing. It seems odd. For a lot of us, our, what we think is our most intimate experience is our sense of us. But the Buddha's pointing out there's something even more intimate than that, and it's just the events happening in a causal chain, causal sequence, without reference to a world, without reference to who's there in the world. That's even more intimate. So I'm trying to get really intimate right here. to find that you're creating less and less suffering for yourself here in the present moment. And it'll be a really good skill so that you don't keep on continuing to create suffering after death. The Buddha's got everything covered. He doesn't cover just the present moment. He doesn't say, don't worry about death, just focus on the present moment. He says, think about death, but that should get you focused back here. Because once you've got right here really taken care of, And that can ensure your future as well. No suffering now, no suffering on into the future. That's why the Dharma is a complete teaching. It's not like an ostrich that says, okay, I'm going to pretend that death is not going to happen, or that it isn't relevant to my life. After all, the Buddha was not an ostrich. He was said to have the all-around eye. And he took care of the problem of suffering in an all-around way. 